10. Loving the Hermit Without Feeding Her Fear Next morning Snow White woke up, and when she saw the seven dwarfs, she was frightened. But they were friendly. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs My mother lives in the safety of her shell, like a turtle hiding in the deep end of a lake, avoiding the lures above. It's a depressing existence. She doesn't trust anyone, not even members of her own family. From Sandy's earliest age, her mother undermined her self-confidence and discouraged her curiosity about life. Because the hermit lacks internal calmness, she is unable to provide the non-anxious presence needed to soothe and comfort her children and may discourage them from exploring the world. She communicates anxiety through her fretfulness, tone of voice, and her tendency to catastrophize. Although she believes that she is protecting her children, the hermit's fear diminishes her ability to solve problems, to think clearly, and to make decisions. During the Great Depression, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt warned, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The wisdom in his admonition is evident in the hermit's behavior. Her fear is the greatest threat to her survival and to her children's self-confidence. Sandy began treatment for depression when she was 45 years old. Everyone in her family had been treated for depression, except her mother. Too distrustful to confide in a therapist, Sandy's mother insisted that she did not need help. Although most hermits may never come to the attention of mental health professionals, adult children such as Sandy verify their prevalence. My mother talked to her mother at least two or three times a day. She had no close friends and rarely socialized. Looking back on it, it's obvious that my mother never separated from her own mother. When Sandy started therapy, her mother warned her that therapy will change your personality. She asked Sandy if she talked about what a terrible mother you have. Sandy calmly replied, Of course we talk about you, but not in the way you think. Harold Blum explains, The paranoid personality tends to misperceive and distort reality in selected areas. Persistent fantasies of outer or inner danger coexist with unreasonable expectation and exaggeration of hostile threat and exquisite sensitivity to minor mishaps and injuries. Affection and commitment are unreliable, and disappointments in relationships are regarded as potentially menacing or malevolent. When Sandy was a child, her mother smothered her with overprotection. Her mother controlled her television programs, her friendships, her clothes, and was jealous of Sandy's relationships with others. Blum states, The patient may imagine that thoughts and feelings are deviously communicated to or from others, and secrets stolen and betrayed. Paranoid fears of invasion and engulfment are paired with paradoxical fears of desertion and disloyal rejection, so that neither intimacy nor separation are acceptable. There is no comfortable distance or position, and if the child is not being watched and controlled, then the child must be jealously guarded with monitoring of movement and direction. Conversations with her mother increased Sandy's anxiety and undermined her tenuous self-confidence. The hermit may suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, and uncontrollable fear rules her perceptions. Her children may find it difficult to understand why neither intimacy nor separation is comfortable. Sandy needed help managing the thoughts and feelings that result from living with a chronically anxious mother. The hermit's children need guidance in structuring a relationship based on their own perceptions. The Fear of the Day Club Reevaluate rather than react to fear. The nature and focus of the hermit's anxiety can change from moment to moment. Because they expect something bad to happen, they may avoid new experiences. They expect bad news, dwell on bad news, and report unconfirmed bad news. Sandy's mother telephoned one morning to tell her that a terrible car accident had occurred on one of two routes her husband took to work. Sandy's heart began racing as she considered the possibility that her husband might have been involved in the accident. 
When she pressed her mother for the exact location of the wreck, her mother breathlessly replied, Oh, I didn't take time to listen. I don't know. At that point, Sandy recognized a familiar pattern, the distinctive mark of the false alarm, fear with no facts. Sandy said gently, Mother, Pete left over two hours ago. I'm sure he made it safely to work. Sandy's mother dreaded receiving the mail because she expected only bills or letters from collection agencies. Sandy joked that her mother belonged to the Fear of the Day Club and tried to ignore her mother's obsessive, paranoid thoughts. She resented her ability to trigger adrenaline surges, exacerbate Sandy's own fears, and stir up anxiety. The hermit's adult children may resent the underlying message that life is too dangerous. Unlike the witch, the hermit does not intend to frighten her children. She controls her children in order to protect them. Anxiety, however, is contagious, and her children may feel more secure when they are away from her than when they are with her. Adult children of hermits must protect themselves from internalizing their mother's fear by asking for details before they react. They should never react to incomplete, vague, or sketchy information provided by their mother and must learn to rely on their own perception, intuition, and judgment. She undermines my self-confidence. She can't give you something she doesn't have. The hermit teaches her children that the world is a dangerous place because, for her, it was. Unfortunately, the hermit's adult children need to be cautious about sharing their fears with their mother. Her response most likely will exacerbate their fear and undermine their self-confidence. Sandy made the mistake of telling her mother about a conflict with her boss. Her mother catastrophized the situation, telephoning her several times a day, vilifying her boss, suggesting that he was out to get Sandy, implying that Sandy would soon be fired. Sandy found herself having to reassure her mother that she would not be fired, and regretted having told her about the minor disagreement. The hermit catastrophizes insignificant events and makes mountains out of molehills. The hermit cannot provide emotional support or bolster her child's self-confidence because she lacks self-confidence herself. The sad reality is that her children, and often her spouse, tune her out because she overreacts, leaving her increasingly isolated and paranoid. Unless someone helps her distinguish between legitimate anxiety and irrational fear, the hermit's panic can escalate. Sandy said, Mother, telling me that my boss is out to get me doesn't make me feel any better. In fact, it makes me feel worse. When I told you that my boss and I had an argument, I needed you to tell me that you understood my feelings. I am not afraid of being fired for disagreeing with my boss. The hermit's adult children must separate their fears from their mother's fears. She denies what she said and acts like I'm crazy. Believe in yourself and your own basic goodness. The hermit does not realize how panic prevents her from thinking clearly, from organizing her thoughts, planning activities, or participating in life. She lives from one fearful moment to the next. Nothing but the present matters to the hermit, whose emotional energy is invested in scanning for danger. Therefore, she is not likely to remember previous paranoid accusations or inappropriate behavior. Asking the hermit if she remembers saying that the store clerk tried to cheat her is like asking a soldier if he remembers dodging a specific bullet. The hermit is in the midst of an ongoing battle for survival. Sandy's mother denied inappropriate behavior and never apologized for her paranoid accusations. After her mother accused her brother of stealing her wallet and later found it in the closet, she denied the accusation. By the time she found her wallet, her mind was filled with worry about a credit card she had misplaced. Sandy's mother projected her own confused thinking onto Sandy, making statements such as, You twisted my words! Sandy occasionally resorted to humor to respond to her mother's confused thinking. 
But holding on to her belief in her own basic goodness, Sandy was able to laugh and say, Mother, you are the only person in the world who can leave me feeling so confused. Sometimes we have fun together, but I always end up being disappointed. Expect rejection to follow closeness. Sandy and her mother shared a love for reading. Their mutual interest in literature was one of the few warm connections between them, and nurturing this positive aspect of their relationship was important. However, an unexpected, hostile comment from her mother often ended enjoyable interactions. Closeness makes the hermit feel vulnerable. As if she suddenly realizes that her guard is down, warm interactions are often followed by abrupt attacks or paranoid accusations that push others away. Adult children are consistently disappointed in the brevity of positive interactions and may feel foolish for allowing themselves to trust her. Unaware of her role in these interactions, the hermit may adamantly deny her hostility if confronted. Adult children can protect themselves by keeping interactions brief and by ending conversations following positive interactions. She twists and distorts what really happened. Calmly maintain your perspective. The hermit often misperceives innocuous interactions as threatening or rejecting. For instance, Sandy's mother responded with hostility when a sales clerk asked for identification. Her mother perceived the clerk's request as intrusive and offensive, rather than a matter of policy established for the store's protection. When Sandy later asked why her mother was rude to the clerk, her mother blamed the clerk for being rude to her. On another occasion, her mother reported that Sandy's husband had bawled her out and that she could not repeat what he had said to her. Sandy was surprised to hear that her husband had been rude to her mother and questioned him about the interaction. Her husband explained that her mother had been fretting about their three-year-old son not wearing his hat. He said, All I said to your mother was, Betty, I don't want to hear any more about the hat. Her husband was shocked to hear her mother's distorted version of the interaction and resented the implication that he had been rude. She has no social life. Being alone is her choice, not yours. Sandy invited her mother on several trips, encouraged her to volunteer for different organizations, and to join clubs where she could meet other women her age. Her mother simply refused to participate in group activities and was too fearful to travel. Sandy felt sorry for her, but eventually gave up trying to encourage her to participate in life. Her mother preferred being alone in her house with the doors and windows locked. Adult children of hermits must respect their mother's desire for isolation. They do not, however, have to join her. They are not responsible for entertaining her, for bringing her out of her shell, or for her decision to remain reclusive. The more they try to coax her out, the more fearful and resentful she may become. Efforts to change her environment are unlikely to succeed. Everything's a plot. Respond to conspiracy theories with reason. Sandy's mother obsessed over daily news reports of crime, murders, robberies, and rapes, she followed international news with the eye of a CIA agent, proposing wild theories about possible attacks on the United States from various countries. Sandy's mother lived her life as though everyone was out to get her. Adult children of hermits should not ridicule, tease, or exacerbate their mother's fears. They must guard against succumbing to her anxiety in order to be able to evaluate situations rationally. In order to live their lives fully and meaningfully, they must free themselves from the hermit's perspective of the world as a dangerous place. Although fear controls the hermit, adult children must learn to control fear. Adult children need to counter conspiracy theories with reason. For example, Sandy's mother became enraged when a neighbor built a fence near her property line. Her mother demanded that the neighbor remove the fence and accused him of intentionally intruding onto her property. 
Sandy pointed out that the fence surrounded the neighbor's yard on all sides and therefore was certainly not meant as a personal attack against her mother. Although her mother calmed down, she stated, Just wait and see. He's trying to provoke me. Her meals and eating habits are bizarre. Plan meals in comfortable settings. Organizing a social event, such as a dinner or a party, may be overwhelming for the borderline hermit. Anxiety can prevent her from being able to follow a recipe, decide what to do first, or set the table. Preparing food can feel like an overwhelming responsibility. One Sunday, Sandy's mother invited her family for dinner. When Sandy arrived with her husband and three children, she was amazed to find the table bare. She checked the refrigerator and found one small pan of jello and bits of dried cheese and leftover meat. When she asked her mother about what she intended to serve, her mother replied, Oh, I just thought we'd fill in around jello. Because food is taken in and becomes part of the self, the hermit may fear poisoning herself and others. Sandy's mother overcooked meat because she believed it was the only way to kill bacteria. As a result, Sandy learned to dislike meat and became a vegetarian after she left home. Dinner time in Sandy's childhood home was not a warm, pleasant experience. Sandy's mother frequently announced that they were having scraps for dinner. Her mother viewed meals as a time to use up food, rather than a time for emotional and physical nourishment. As an adult, Sandy avoided her mother's cooking. Instead, she invited her mother to her home or suggested eating at a restaurant, relieving her mother from the dreaded responsibility of meal preparation. Food serves to regulate anxiety for many hermits. Their relationship with food reflects fluctuations in self-esteem. Food is used to self-soothe and may therefore be consumed in great quantities whenever the hermit's anxiety is high. The hermit may also project her feelings about food onto her family. One time when Sandy was cramming for a final exam, her mother brought her a bag of cookies and a piece of cake advising, just keep putting food in, you'll feel better. The hermit may consume food unconsciously, particularly when alone, in a desperate attempt to fill herself up. Unfortunately, she is later filled with guilt and shame. She is afraid of the strangest things. Point out the consequences of irrational fear. Hermit mothers have a variety of fears and may develop obsessive-compulsive rituals. Sandy's mother engaged in a number of rituals before leaving the house. She checked and rechecked the iron, the stove, the coffee maker, and the locks on the doors. The hermit may project her fear of losing control onto appliances, fearing that they may overheat and cause a fire. Some hermits fear being poisoned, robbed, attacked, or mugged. Afraid of answering the door, one mother refused to open it for a delivery man. Later, her adult daughter called her to see if the flowers she had sent for her mother's birthday had arrived. Many hermits keep their blinds closed during the day, avoid going out at night, going out in public, or answering the door and the telephone. The hermit misses out on the good things in life simply because of her fear. Adult children of hermit mothers should minimize, not ridicule, their mother's fear. Sandy's mother insisted that she call her after visiting to ensure that Sandy had arrived home safely. Sandy refused to perpetuate her mother's fear by calling and explained that if anything happened, her mother would be notified anyway. No amount of reassurance will ease the hermit's worry. When her mother fretted about leaving the house, Sandy reassured her, Well... If the house burns down, you can move to an apartment. If I'm in an accident, the police will phone you. Pointing out the consequences of an actualized fear is the only necessary response. She drives me crazy. Set limits to preserve your sanity. The anxiety of the hermit mother is contagious. When riding in Sandy's car, her mother constantly shouted warnings such as, Look out! That car is turning! Watch out! He's putting his brakes on! Sandy would become so agitated and nervous that she could no longer concentrate on driving. 
She pulled the car over to the side of the road, saying, Mother, you are increasing my chance of having an accident by making me so nervous. If you say one more thing, I'm turning around and taking you back home. Although the hermit does not intend to undermine her children's self-confidence, the end result is that her adult children may not be able to tolerate closeness. When they feel they are losing their grip on reality, their ability to think clearly, or their ability to perform competently, they have every right to create distance. The hermit's adult children must trust their own intuition and their own feelings. They must separate their fears from their mothers and point out the consequences of irrational fear. Reacting to fear instead of to the situation can have deadly consequences. The Danger of Fear as children, we protect our mother because our survival is dependent upon hers. As adults, however, our survival depends upon our ability to protect ourselves. The hermit's adult children must rely on their own judgment when determining the risks of a given situation. Rather than automatically reacting to their mother's fear or completely discounting it, they must reevaluate the appropriateness of their mother's reaction. Some adult children react with hostility, resentment, or cynicism to the hermit's obsessive worry. Negative reactions that demean the hermit increase her hostility and feed her fear. Reacting to fear complicates a problem. Reacting to the problem reduces fear. Numerous examples demonstrate how anxiety, fear, and panic can lead to death. Gavin de Becker recounts the story of a man who was attacked by a shark. Although the man was terrified as the shark dragged him under by his chest, he searched for a way to secure his release and plunged his thumb into the shark's eye socket. The shark immediately released the man from its massive jaws. Perceiving the situation as a problem to be solved rather than succumbing to fear made the difference between life and death. Adult children of hermit mothers need to assess the source of their fear and anxiety. Answering three simple questions can help keep them calm. 1. Why am I anxious? 2. What is the problem? 3. How can I solve the problem? Recognizing the source of anxiety and responding appropriately is essential to controlling it. A patient who worked as a nursing supervisor related the following incident. An elderly stroke patient who was unable to speak continually shrieked and moaned from her hospital bed until a nurse responded to her. The overworked and anxious nurse ran to the patient's room as frequently as possible, responding to every shriek. But as soon as the nurse left her room, the patient resumed her wailing. The second night, a different nurse was assigned to the woman's care. The nurse did not internalize the patient's anxiety and calmly responded to the shrieking patient by stating, Mrs. X, I know you want my attention, but I have other patients who need me too. Wailing and crying will not bring me to you any sooner than I am able to come. Please stop wailing. When the nurse left the room, the patient stopped shrieking and patiently waited for the nurse's attention. Responding to anxiety with anxiety feeds anxiety. Responding to anxiety with firm reassurance reduces anxiety. Adult children have a right to be angry, annoyed, and frustrated with the hermit. They have the responsibility, however, to deal with their feelings as constructively as possible. Otherwise, their behavior replicates their mother's behavior and reinforces the negative cycle. Belittling, ridiculing, or teasing the hermit is never constructive. Maintaining a sense of one's own basic goodness depends on the ability to confirm the self without disparaging others. Step 1. Confirm separateness. I am. My mother lives vicariously through me. She actually depends on me to tell her what to do. I took care of her, protected her, and tried to make her happy. I just can't do it anymore. When Sandy was a child, her mother told her, You are my life. If anything happens to you, I'll kill myself. 
The hermit mother often relies on the all-good child to help her negotiate safely through life. Sandy's mother told her that she could not survive without her, a role reversal that grew stronger as Sandy grew older. The hermit may blame her unhappiness on the no-good child and attribute her happiness to the all-good child. Whether the projections are positive or negative, the hermit's children struggle with separation. Sandy's older brother was the designated no-good child. He minimized contact with his mother and kept conversations brief. No-good adult children must limit their interactions with their mother if she continues to undermine their self-esteem. Self-esteem can give way like an avalanche, burying the unsuspecting no-good child under cold, dark feelings of worthlessness. One negative comment from a borderline mother can trigger suicidal reactions in the already devastated no-good child. In cases of ongoing denigration, the no-good child may need to sever the relationship with the hermit mother completely. In order for the hermit's children to individuate, they must free themselves from their mother's perceptions and act in their own best interest. Kohut describes the self as an independent center of initiative and perception. Expressing the self, therefore, requires the ability to act in one's own interest. Although Sandy understood her brother's need to distance himself, her separation anxiety emerged in the following dream. Sandy was crossing a rickety bridge with two young children, holding the hand of an older woman. A rotten plank broke under the weight of her foot, and she caught a glimpse of a cavernous pit below. As she neared the center of the bridge, she recognized the danger of continuing further, as well as the danger of turning back. Sandy's dream symbolized the danger of holding on to her mother, as well as the fear of letting go. Margaret Little commented that the idea of losing one's identity, of being merged in some undefined, homogeneous mass, or lost forever in a bottomless pit, is very frightening and disturbing, an idea which we all tend to avoid. Sandy could no longer hold her mother's hand. Letting go, however, felt dangerous, as if Sandy or her mother might plunge into the abyss below. Sandy had never taken a vacation without including her mother. When she decided to take her first vacation alone with her children, she announced to her mother, I need some time away, alone with the kids. I'm taking a trip. Making this step toward individuation was extremely difficult. Sandy's mother felt abandoned and begged her to phone her each night when she was away. Sandy said gently, Mother, you worry too much about things that never happen. Your fear is contagious, and it's hard for me to deal with. I don't want to call you every night. Her mother became defensive and hostile, retorting, I'm not afraid of anything. You don't know anything about fear. Why don't you grow up? Sandy triggered a defensive reaction in her mother because she spoke the truth too directly. Her mother then projected her own failure to grow up onto Sandy, which insulted Sandy and left her feeling just as her mother felt, attacked. Winnicott explained, Adults must be expected to be continuing the process of growing and growing up. Growing up requires separating from mother, whether she likes it or not. Although no approach is guaranteed to succeed, the most constructive method of separating from the hermit is simply to make I am statements and to avoid you statements. Although empathy does not always work, the outcome for Sandy might have been more positive if Sandy had said, Mother, I know this will be very hard on you, but I'm worn out and need to get away. I need some time alone. Please try to understand. Although Sandy's mother expected her to phone daily, Sandy responded according to her own needs. She needed distance from her mother and did not telephone her until she returned from vacation. When she returned home, she took more control of interactions with her mother. Conversations with her mother felt tedious. Sandy mumbled on occasion, uh-huh, or, oh, really, without following her mother's rambling train of thought. She felt drained by the end of their conversations. Eventually, Sandy reduced the length of the phone conversations 
by interjecting simple I am statements. When her mother phoned, she calmly but firmly stated, I am in the middle of something. What did you want to tell me? Sandy directed the conversation, kept her mother on track, and ended the conversation when her mother's train of thought derailed. Sandy needed to repeat I am statements two or three times when speaking to her mother. Her mother had a habit of telling Sandy what she should wear, how to comb her hair, and even how to raise her children. Sandy responded calmly but insistently, I am capable of deciding what is best for me. Although Sandy could not change her mother's point of view, she refused to allow her mother to change her point of view. The hermit's adult children do not have to relinquish their own beliefs in order to keep peace with their mother. Confirming separateness requires holding on to differences in opinions and perceptions. Sandy's mother denigrated successful, powerful people. She assumed that they were evil, self-centered, and greedy. When Sandy's mother made negative statements about such people, Sandy replied, I am impressed with successful people. Some people might be corrupt, but many successful people are trustworthy and hardworking. Her mother grew silent and seemed to consider Sandy's perspective. Several years after Sandy began therapy, she glanced at herself in the mirror as she dressed one morning. For the first time in her life, she felt beautiful. She saw a gentleness in her appearance that she had never noticed before, and a gleam in her eye that reflected her heightened self-esteem. She had grown up seeing herself through her mother's eyes, afraid of success, of feeling good about herself, as if it were dangerous to enjoy herself and her life. She recalled her mother reproving her with, Just who do you think you are? whenever she had voiced pride in her accomplishments as a child. For the first time, she saw herself through her own eyes and heard her own voice say, I have something important to contribute. I am a good person, and I have a right to feel good about myself. The hermit's adult children should not have to spend their lives ensconced within their mother's shell. They must allow their mother to make her own decisions about life without sacrificing the right to their own lives. Step 2. Create Structure I Will When my husband and I bought our first home, my mother wanted to buy a home in the same neighborhood. My husband had a fit. He put his foot down and told me it was out of the question. It was easy for me to tell my mother that my husband wasn't comfortable with her living that close, but I didn't have the courage to say that I didn't want her living there either. I've always had the feeling that if I let her, she'd move in with us. Sandy's courage to separate bloomed when she recognized that her mother's expectations were unreasonable and perhaps life-threatening. When she told her mother that she should not buy a house in the same neighborhood, her mother cried, Nobody wants me around, and tried to hug Sandy. As if in the clutches of an octopus, Sandy felt both repulsion and pity and repressed the urge to peel her mother's arms off her and scream, Yuck! The borderline mother's crying can become so wearisome that the hermit's children lose the ability to empathize. Crying is the earliest and most primitive mechanism to assure attachment and evoke caretaking from others. Judith Nelson observes, no matter what the precipitant, the purpose of crying is to bring the caretaker into physical proximity, first and foremost for protection, and secondarily for nurturing ministrations such as feeding or removing painful or noxious stimuli. Infant cries are a pre-verbal, come here, I need you. The hermit's adult children may ignore their mother's tears, feeling manipulated and resentful. The hermit's pain, however, is quite real. Eventually, Sandy learned to distinguish between what she needed for herself and what her mother needed. Sandy explained, Mother, I'll always help you in an emergency. I won't abandon you, but I'm not comfortable living so close. I need my own life. Sandy found it easier to comfort her mother when she focused first on her own needs. 
Margaret Little explains that the child is trapped in the double bind of love and hate and is in the impossible situation where he cannot but develop biologically and yet must remain part of an entity that cannot be dissolved. Little wrote, To stay dependent is to be destroyed. Sandy struggled with her fear that becoming her own person might destroy her mother. To become a person means literally to destroy the mother and to bear unlimited loss and guilt. Because borderlines lack object constancy, they have no access to an internal, loving, approving, protective self that is constant regardless of external events. Therefore, they try to rely on their own children to hold them together. As adults, children of hermits have a choice about how much they are willing to give, how much they can emotionally withstand, and how much of their own lives they are willing to sacrifice. Step 3. Clarify Consequences. I won't. I guess I finally hit bottom five years ago. The hole was too deep, and I couldn't see my way out. That's when I decided to come to therapy. Now my life finally feels like my own. I don't feel guilty about being happy, and I do what I can for my mother. I know I'm entitled to enjoying my life, and when I think about my mother, I just feel sad. It's not my fault that she spent her life living in fear, and it's not my job to protect her. Sandy gradually stopped parenting her mother. Surprisingly, her mother eventually formed a relationship with a widowed neighbor, and the two women looked after each other. Because the hermit needs the approval of an idealized other, Sandy's mother was sufficiently motivated to meet Sandy's expectations. Sandy defined her limits, consistently enforced consequences, and encouraged her mother to become more independent. When her mother became critical, Sandy announced calmly, I won't listen to negative comments. I don't think they're good for either one of us. Over time, Sandy established a more comfortable relationship with her mother. Sandy wanted to hold on to the positive elements of the relationship with her mother without sacrificing her own life. She did not want her mother living too close. She did not want to have a conversation with her daily. She did not want to hear about her physical ailments unless they were life-threatening. She clarified these limits to her mother clearly, calmly, and firmly. She pointed out behaviors that irritated or annoyed her as soon as possible after they occurred. Sandy used natural and logical consequences when dealing with her mother's inappropriate behavior. She shared brief stories about her life with her mother when time allowed. If her mother responded negatively, Sandy distanced herself and ended the conversation. She learned to conserve her emotional energy and paced herself like a marathon runner in order to prevent exhaustion. She gave what she could and kept her focus on her own self-preservation. The hermit mother leads a tragically lonely life. Adult children can neither please her nor protect her and should not try to control her. Adult children of borderline mothers should heed De Becker's advice. When a person requires something unattainable, such as total submission to an unreasonable demand, it is time to stop negotiating, because it's clear the person cannot be satisfied. Getting pulled into discussions about the original issue misses the point. It's as if one party has come to the table wanting a million dollars and the other party is prepared to give five dollars, or no dollars. In such situations, there's nothing to negotiate. Adult children cannot sacrifice their lives, their sanity, their health, or their well-being in the effort to protect the hermit mother. They can give only as much as they feel is safe to give and must release themselves from guilt in order to enjoy life. The average person cannot imagine the intensity of the anxiety experienced by children of borderlines who struggle with the process of separation. Adult children experience annihilation anxiety, the fear of ceasing to exist while still alive, when merged with their hermit mothers. 
Because their mother fears living, the hermit's children have no choice but to leave her alone. <laughs>